uh, it's such an honor to be here. Um, and, uh, you know, when Sharaja Chief first came to discuss his report, uh, this has been something that I've been interested in for a long time. There are very few things that one uses the adjectives of dangerous, nuisance, costly, unlawful, illegal, and inappropriate, but also uses the adjectives of convenient, organized, trusted, present, ubiquitous, affordable, liked, and respected. There's almost nothing which falls into both of these categories. And the reason is, uh, you know, in, in the world of health economics, uh, you know, there's a very seminal paper which underlies much of how we think about health, although most of us may not know that paper. The author of that paper, Kenneth Arrow, was probably one of the greatest living economists of, of, uh, of the last 100 years, who died last year. Uh, and he wrote this paper basically to say, look, health is one of these unusual things where there's asymmetric information. You know, what the provider provides for me, I can't really assess in any way because I'm not a doctor. So, uh, therefore, there is a strong role for government here because only government can play the role of making sure that you're getting treatment that is actually appropriate. This is not like purchasing any other commodity. You can't just go out and purchase. You can purchase, you know, a house and you can say, I like that house or a chair. But with health, it's very different because of this asymmetric information. That underlies everything, universal health coverage, pretty much everything else. But this is essentially what is exploited by the idea of, of unqualified uh, med medical practitioners. And um, there's been work on this because uh, this is a topic that is of interest across different countries. So Ken Leonard, who is a you know, well-known writer on these topics, for instance, in Kenya. And Ken went out and lived in Kenya for many years to understand what it was. And he found that people will go to these unqualified medical practitioners if it's something quick, you know, something that is a psychosomatic illness, something like that, you know, you need to get rid of the spirit, that sort of thing, you go there. But if you have a fever, if you need surgery, no one goes to this guy for surgery, they go to the hospital for surgery. So people sort of knew what they wanted from each of these places, but the advantages were very clear with these unqualified medical practitioners, or you call them traditional healers or whatever it is. One is that, um, that they put an effort. They might not have skill, but they substitute for skill with effort. And this is what Jishnu Das's very good work from the Macquarie Project has found that these guys, you know, if you looked at the public sector doctor versus the these quacks, the public sector doctor was much better qualified, but had his feet up or her feet up and was reading the paper for much of the day. And, you know, the little amount of time that they spent, they were very good because they were obviously the superior doctors, but they put in no effort at all. If you looked at actual look, you know, following checklists for seeing if you prescribed a drug appropriately or followed actual checklists, the unqualified practitioner actually tried to follow these. In fact, uh, you know, Shailaj sent me this video, maybe sent it to all the panelists, uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, on an NDTV special on this, which shows all these unqualified CNN, okay. All of them sitting in, uh, you know, in these training sessions, just like we have medical, you know, uh, continuing medical education for doctors. These guys are getting continuing uh, unqualified medical education, sitting in these specific rooms and they're watching these videos where someone is showing them how to do this and how to do that. They are not, I mean, they're not stupid and they, they obviously enjoy this trust for this reason. The second reason why uh, they, they are liked is also because uh, the way in which they um, they take payment very often is outcome contingent. Now, if you go to the doctor, even if you go to Apollo, it's not like they say, I will fix your problem. And if I don't fix your problem, you don't have to pay me. They're going to collect their money no matter what, whether they've misdiagnosed you or whatever it is. These guys actually take outcome contingent payments, which means you feel better. And that's when you pay me. And the advantage of that is that then I know that I'm paying for a service. It may be placebo, but at least that's what it really is. Now, in the case of antibiotics, which is a which is a you know the place where this the rubber really meets the road, and uh, you know for those of you who know something about the drug resistance problem, we have an enormous amount of use of antibiotics in this country. India is the number one consumer of antibiotics in the country, and uh, this is something which is creating extraordinary drug resistance. And this is something which we really can't solve unless we take this problem on head on. I think Mr. Mishra, you know, uh, I guess unusually candid for someone who is a sitting bureaucrat. I mean, I think you explained it perfectly, which is this is something that whether you like it or don't like it, it's unavoidable. And it's something that you really have to address. And I think this report does 
uh, I think you're very modest about it. This is really a good report. I mean, it really should get, you know, wider coverage and get published. Uh, because it, it not only describes a problem in great detail, it describes uh, it describes personal experiences with the system, both from people who use the system as well as uh, you know um, you know people who are providing that service. I don't know how you got people to talk to you, but you know that's that's quite amazing because most of these doctors would run away if uh, if if you really went to them. So uh, you know, you <laughs> I'm sure it was age and beauty, and it both worked. So. Uh, it, you know, so these are so this is a really really valuable report. I don't think I mean I'm not just saying it because she's asked me to come and sit here. I've actually read this entire report, every single page, and I commented on it for her. And it's actually you know full of information that we really don't have in one place. Shocking that we don't have a report like this. And there are four options here. One is uh, you can crowd out. So I think as Mr. Mishra said, it's in the report. You basically do a better job of public health. But that's not going to solve the problem because it's going to be hard to crowd them out. Uh, the second is regulate them out of existence. Again, very difficult to do. If we could have regulated them out of existence, we would have done it a long time ago. The third is to co-opt them and then you train them or you bring them into the system. So that's the other end of the spectrum. And the fourth is something in between. And I don't think the report necessarily explains something in between. But what if you get a hand, cop, your, your hands on a copy of the report, I think the best thing about this report, apart from all the information, is the 10 strategies that have been mentioned on what we can concretely do to address the problem. And here, Mishraji, this is actually the 10 things which I think we really should do. The mapping exercise, uh, the need for recognition of the problem, the targeted enforcement. I think if the government wants a plan, the plan is right here with sufficient detail. Uh, and, you know, my own personal bias is, you know, this last number 10, surveillance of antibiotic overuse, uh, which is uh, both in TB as well as for other bacterial infections. This is really, really serious to take on because the one thing, and again, if you look at the data on what drugs are given out, uh, the antibiotics are number one. Why? Because the antibiotics always make someone feel better. I mean, I suppose they could give Prozac as well, but, you know, they give out the antibiotics and, and everyone feels fine. Um, so it, 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 there is really concrete recommendations here, and I, and I would hope that within some time-bound fashion, we could actually go through and implement at least you know four or five out of these ten strategies because it's so beautifully laid out, and then uh, you know come back to more, have more of these discussions. So uh, with that, I'll just say that you know this is uh, you know this is a report that's really really w worth reading, and and I think. Uh, it's not a question of whether we want or don't want unqualified medical practitioners. That is not a choice that's really available to us. They are you know, as much a fact of life as everything else is about the country. Uh, it is what we have to accept. And the question is, how do we really accept it? Do we accept it? Do we ignore it, which is what we do right now? Uh, do we fully bring it on board, which is quite challenging? Or is there a middle way for which these strategies have been really helpful? So thank you very much for the opportunity.